On this show, The Daily Debrief, we have often talked about the rising tensions in the Korean Peninsula. Now, the region had been relatively peaceful for decades, but in recent times, tensions have arisen and trust has broken down on both sides. A key reason is South Korea's active participation in US strategies and maneuvers in the region. Meanwhile, North Korea conducted its third round of missile tests in a week. We go to Anish for the latest. Anish, thanks for joining us. Let's first take a look at the immediate developments. How do you see these missile tests? What has been the response uh, from South Korea? And how do we also see some of the recent developments? These include, you know, decisions on the question of reunification itself, the institutions connected to it. So how, what do you make of all this? Yes, Prashant. So what we're looking at is the a third uh, such uh, cruise missile test uh, happening uh, within less than a week, actually. Uh, and this is pretty much uh, in line with uh, the kind of tensions that have been escalating in the region, especially in the Korean Peninsula uh, over the past uh, few months now. Uh, the thing is that we have to obviously look at it in the larger context, but what we're looking at right now um, uh, is that relations have really worsened to a point where we are looking at confrontations uh, at every possible juncture and these cruise missile tests are pretty much just a sign that uh, things are not going to be the same it used to be uh, and there is going to be far more confrontations especially uh, from the north uh, right now because which it has pretty much given up uh, so to say on this entire thing of reunification this entire goal of reunification which was at the uh, you know, the, uh, the foundations of any uh, attempt of peace uh, or negotiations between the two Koreas. So, uh, right now, what we'll uh, on Monday, the missile, the cruise missile that was uh, launched was a submarine launched cruise missile, and it is pretty much a new uh, brand of uh, cruise missile that has been developed by North Korea. And this in itself uh, has been a big uh, matter of concern for the South because obviously uh, the development of new missile technology by the North uh, has always been a matter of alarm for uh, the South and obviously its ally, uh, the United States, which holds a massive uh, military presence in the region as well. So in uh, all in all, what we are looking at is like a very a deliberate attempt to escalate tensions uh, on the part of the North, but definitely uh, something that has been happening for a while now, uh, and it cannot be divorced or you know looked in isolation from what has been happening for the past few years now, especially from uh, the South and the United States, the kind of provocations that have happened over the years, and which has led to the situation right now. Well, Anish, now stepping back a bit, what does this really imply for the region? We have actually talked about on this show quite often how this region has generally been quite peaceful, but now in recent times, tensions have really been escalating. So how do you see the broader context? Tensions are nothing new between two Koreas, Prashant, but what we are looking at right now is a, probably a point of no return has been reached. Uh, with recently, we have uh, seen uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un uh, talk about uh, and even uh, pretty much stating that reunification is no longer a goal. It is not viable. It is not desirable, and that it is going to treat uh, the South Korea as uh, as uh, an enemy uh, or, or a very you know an enemy state or, or an enemy entity, and no longer part of Korea. And uh, obviously, the ultimate goal would include, uh, you know, reclaiming the entirety of the Korean Peninsula. But the language of reunification is pretty much absent. Uh, that also was coupled with uh, calls by Kim uh, to uh, dismantle pretty much every uh, attempt or an, any monument that existed, uh, especially the arch of reunif reunification in Pyongyang. Uh, that uh, has been, uh, you know, at the center that has always been looked up as uh, this monument for uh, a future hope of a uni reunified Korea, uh, which is now going to be, uh, which apparently has been destroyed or demolished uh, very recently um, between the 19th and the 23rd of this month. Uh, obviously, uh, this was not as widely reported, and but there was indication that the North Korean leadership 
uh, has wanted uh, the arch to be demolished. Uh, but we, we are yet to get like proper official confirmation from North Korean officials so far. But definitely multiple reports and satellite images have shown that the arch is missing right now. And that itself clearly shows that tensions, it, like it's a symbolic, symbolic act, but definitely what we're looking at is that that without any you know talk or any uh, any idea of a reunification or possible reunification peace talks become uh, completely irrelevant uh, in the case of inter-korean relations and that is pretty much the point where we are at and this is dangerous because we must remember that uh, just a couple of years ago uh, we were already talking about how uh, the two Koreas came together for a declaration to end the Korean War, which uh, is de facto in place, even though, and it's only ceasefire between the two sides that is holding uh, any kind of hostilities from getting out of hand. Uh, and at this point in time, if these tensions continue, uh, the war can be reactivated. It is no longer a very distant uh, possibility it is something that is pretty much at the horizon right now and uh, and we need to wait and see how uh, the South Korean administration especially the conservative and the you know the very hardliner uh, Yoon government uh, which has been which can be held responsible for the kind of provocations that have led to the situation where reunification or even for that matter peace talks have become completely irrelevant as uh, as far as North Korea is concerned, uh, is some uh, how he is going to respond to all of this. Uh, there is there has been no statement so far, uh, especially and which is uh, kind of jarring considering how he had pretty much a statement or a provocative statement for pretty much anything that happened uh, when it comes to North Korea. So this kind of silence right now, a very studied silence at a time when he is also beleaguered by his uh, you know by his own failures in the domestic front uh, pretty much uh, shows that uh, the south the southern side has taken it far more seriously than it i mean like it is quite serious but this is going to be a bigger like the gravity of it is going to be much bigger than uh, what we can we, we could have thought of uh, maybe say a couple of months ago so things have really gone that far and we have to i mean like we can only hope that there can be a reset uh to status quo ante but definitely we are just not in a position to say that uh, that that would be possible especially under the current administration so far and that is a big big problem because as as i keep saying as we have kept saying in this show uh this is a region which hasn't had a war for more than uh, for nearly uh, three quarters of a century and that is something quite novel in the entirety of the uh, you know the modern world right now so if uh, you know war is something that is now quite a looming possibility that should be a matter of concern for everybody and not just uh, the east asians it is pretty much something that can affect everybody around the world right now thanks so much anish for joining us Measles might not seem like an alarming disease to many of us, but it can have a serious impact on a person's health. In recent times, the World Health Organization has been sounding the alarm on a rise in measles cases in many parts of Europe, forcing countries even in other parts of the world to take notice and step up precautions. Why are these, where are these cases increasing and why is it happening? We are joined by Anna. And on multiple episodes, we seem to be discussing diseases which are easily preventable, but nonetheless are causing a great deal of alarm. So let's start with, uh, you know, the WHO, of course, you know, sounding alarm on the number of cases. So let's start with what is the spread, which are the countries which are really affected? Well, uh, one of the uh, most recent alarms was sounded well, in Europe, uh, and that's because there was uh, around a 30-fold increase in the number of cases of measles uh, in the European region last year compared to the uh, compared to the data from the previous one. So uh, while the most affected countries uh, were in the east, so including Russia, uh, some of the uh, some of the news that ma made most headlines, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, they were located in, in in the core European countries, so including the UK. Uh, but what we are seeing is an overall trend, and that's uh, related partly, at least, uh, in the decrease of the uptake of uh, of the vaccine. We do know that uh, we need around ninety five percent 
uh, coverage with the MMR um, vaccine in order to have uh, herd immunity. Uh, but over the years, these uh, percentages have eroded in um, in the UK as well as in the in the rest of Europe. And of course, you know, when when the COVID nineteen pandemics uh, hit. Uh, then there was an additional hit on the public health services. Many people were not able to get their children to get the vaccines. So now we have a bigger population, which is essentially exposed to uh, to the effects of uh, of what we are seeing. Um, but of course, we know that you know since since the alarm has been sounded in Europe, uh, other countries in other regions have also said they would be particularly careful. So we have seen health authorities in Korea, in the US issuing warnings or expressing concern about what's being seen and uh, and asking people to be cautious and to uh, to return to the uh, to the vaccines to the vaccine campaigns that we have uh, we had uh, previously uh, previously seen um, and you know this is not just something to be taken very lightly because you said rightly that you know measles is something that we talk a lot about uh, that has been on the public health agenda for a very long time uh, and some of the public health officials have also recognized that uh, it's that people has have also become a bit accustomed to measles not being such not being perceived such a terrible as such a terrible disease. But we do know that it has it can have very serious uh, side effects and it can it can cause very very serious um, uh, cases of pneumonia meningitis blindness uh, it can even cause that so uh, it's not uh, it's not something that uh, people can discard and say you know it's uh, it's okay to go through it it's actually something that that can be very serious and put a uh, kid's life uh, at risk and, and in this context what are the reasons that you know there is an increase in cases you mentioned of course the question the issue of vaccines but how does it really play out the reason for hesitancy what are some of the other factors contributing to this well uh, if for example, and if we take the UK as a as a case study in this in this regard, uh, there have uh, there has been vaccine hesitancy uh, since the late 1990s because, of course, you know the, there were those discard, of course, uh, uh, allegations that the MMR vaccine was uh, was linked to autism. Uh, but now uh, the public health authorities in the UK are, are warning that it's not only about that. So it's not, of course, people, you know. Uh, people in the past have reluctantly and maybe more cautiously approached uh, va uh, vaccination campaigns for measles. But uh, their numbers right now show that this situation has somewhat improved. So younger parents are more prone to, to get back on the vaccine train and actually get all the doses covered. But what we do see is that there's now uh, a bigger population of younger adults of those who haven't been vaccinated, who are now exposed to the uh, to the disease or who can facilitate the spread. Uh, and then, of course, we do have uh, a large number of kids who have not received uh, vaccines, either because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because uh, the public health services and particularly primary health care has been so weakened that uh, they cannot actually access the vaccines. So it's not only you know about doing a very good a public health campaign and showing to people that that the vaccines work. Uh, it's also about making sure that the vaccines are there for people and that they're easily accessible. That's not the case in the UK right now. And I would say that it's probably not the case in the rest of Europe right now. So one of the big uh, big hurdles in the way of, uh, of health ministries, of those in charge of public health policies right now, is to get a very rapid response, so to increase the number of vaccinations that we're seeing, but also to make sure that, you know, the health workers who are there delivering the vaccines uh, to make sure that the health services that we need to, to actually get those vaccines to the people are there and are properly funded. And uh, thank you so much for that update. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.